The Gospel lesson this morning is from the fourth chapter of the Gospel according to Mark. Uh, We're going to go right to the end of the fourth chapter, starting with verse 35. Let us listen for God's word to us today. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, pour your Holy Spirit upon us this day that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Today in our scripture passage, we hear a story of competing narratives, a narrative of fear and a narrative of faith. And today is also Father's Day, and we who honor fathers, honor them, I would think, because of the narratives with which they formed their children. Today I thank God for the formation I received from my dad. Um, This is one of his stoles, um, so I'm wearing it in honor of him. And I pray that my words live up to the formation I received. Two narratives are always in competition, the narrative of faith and the narrative of fear. And they compete for time and attention with us every day and in this story as well. Jesus has been teaching the crowds by the sea, and this text starts with his suggestion, let us go up to the other side. Let us go over to the other side, the Gentile side of the lake. Let us go over where those we call the others, where those who are not part of our group live. In crossing the sea, they are crossing a social boundary, going where the others, those who are different, live. And while they were on the water, a great windstorm arose, and the boat was in the process of being swamped, and the disciples wake up a sleeping Jesus with the question, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that we are perishing? This has been a week in which we have heard the competing narratives in our news. The news out of Charleston has been very hard to hear, and it has been rife with competing narratives. Those who follow, like the first disciples who followed Jesus into the boat, might well be thinking that a journey into foreign territory sounds risky, that even here at home, and for some people, even in their own churches, some of the faithful may well be in mortal danger. And the same debates, the same kind of competing narratives are heard that have been voiced countless times before. Was the shooter a terrorist or simply a misguided, mentally ill young man? Was this what happened in Charleston about race, or was it about faith, or was it about neither? Politicians and commentators have found a variety of ways to talk about the murders. They have been called an accident that will give ammunition, pun intended, to those who want to take our guns away from us. And a tragic event masterminded by one lone gunman that says nothing at all about the greater community. And one wise soul said, 
This tragedy would have been prevented if the pastor, who was also a legislator, uh, supported concealed carry of guns and was armed, if he had been armed while he was leading Bible study, none of those people would have died. Many have suggested that what occurred is in no way related to the race of those who died. Since the murders on Wednesday night, four black churches have been evacuated, three of them during prayer vigils, honoring those who died in Charleston. Four churches have been evacuated, four black churches because of bomb threats. Bomb threats on the gathering places where people have been called together to pray, to ask God for help, and to lament. And in each of these jurisdictions, the police found the threats credible enough to order evacuation. So is the race of those who died an issue? Is it a factor in what happened, or is it not? And here I have to tell you a personal story. In my own ministry, in every single position, I have served as the first woman in the job. Every single time, I have been the first woman in the job. And my gender has come up in conversation in every single interview I have completed. And some folks in every congregation I have served have let me know that my gender is an issue for them in my ministry relationship there. Some are tickled pink. They are doing handsprings that a woman pastor has been called. And a greater number in every congregation has shared that the fact that I'm a woman has been a barrier for them in their receiving a ministry from and with me. My husband, who has served congregations as long as I have, has yet to have anyone suggest that his maleness, his lack of femaleness, has created a barrier for them. His regrettable lack of female anatomy has yet to be raised in an interview process. So when people suggest to us that gender no longer plays a role in how people are viewed in ministry, or how one's ministry is received, we hear this in light of our experience. In the same way, people of faith, brothers and sisters of ours in Christ who are African American may hear the suggestion that attacks that occur are not related to their race, that there is nothing to fear and that there is nothing that can be done, that African Americans and African American Christians and churches are not at particular risk, they will hear this in light of their own experience. Experience like the 225 suspicious fires at black churches in an 18-month period in 1995 and 96, a bad enough state that the Justice Department opened an investigation and congressional hearings were held. Most of those crimes were never solved. If you Google attacks on black churches, hundreds of articles will immediately surface, many of which will share the troubling information that attacks on black churches continue to plague the African American Christian community. Cross burnings, vandalism, bombings, burnings, and that when the perpetrators are found, they are in almost every case found to be white, most of whom are found to be part of one or another or multiple white supremacist organizations. These organizations have gained size and influence since 2008, and law enforcement agencies in many states track their movements and activities and suggest they are becoming more dangerous, a truth that undoubtedly colors the way African-American Christians see the issue of risk or safety. The drama in our text today happens on the sea. Scholars would tell us this is not coincidental. The sea is the biblical site of chaos. The sea is the chaotic home in biblical understanding of the forces of evil and disorder. It is the place that breeds and feeds the narrative of fear. The creation starts 
in the midst of the chaos of the sea where God's spirit is brooding over the face of the waters and the creation is formless and void. And in Genesis 1 and 2, we see God first making light, right? The first thing that God does is speak light into being and separate life into night and day. And the very second thing that God does is put a dome in the waters, which we call the firmament. This is ancient cosmology. A dome is in the waters, and the waters are all around that dome. This is the way that ancient people understood creation. So God sets limits and boundaries on the chaos of the sea. The chaotic sea breaks into human life in biblical text again during the flood, where the dome that God set up springs leaks top to bottom. The water, if you read that story carefully, you will see the water comes from every direction. It comes from below and it comes from above. So there are leaks throughout the firmament. And until God decides to end the flood, the water keeps coming. But God does decide to end the flood and to save humanity and the earth and promises never to destroy the earth again. The sea is a place of chaos and danger for the Israelites in their flight to Egypt until God enters the chaos of the sea and makes a path where they can cross on dry land. The sea becomes chaotic in our text. A sudden windstorm blows up and the boat and the disciples are at risk of going down. This week has provided ample evidence, if we needed it, that the forces of chaos, of disorder and evil continue to thrive These forces drive and animate the narrative of fear. Indeed, they feed on fear. The forces of chaos draw energy from our faulty presumptions, friends, from misapprehensions and misunderstandings, particularly among we who follow Jesus. When we misunderstand what is happening, when we do not engage the realities, however difficult that emerge, when we fail to ponder, because we are busy, friends, we are busy, and life intervenes, and because we see what is happening in a place like Charleston and a church like Emmanuel African and Methodist Episcopal as totally unrelated to us, when we do not see that, they, that we are as closely related to those brothers and sisters who died at Bible study as we are to those who sit with us in the pews today. That we are part of them and they are part of us. That their joys are our joys and their pain is our pain. When we fail to have faith in Jesus as the one who has come to save us all, who loves us all, who values and gives worth and wonder and joy to us all, we encourage and animate the forces of chaos and disorder. We give power to the narrative of fear. We have to remember that both those who died and the one who murdered them all were active members of the Christian church. Why are black churches a particular target of those who traffic in the narrative of fear? Because, friends, they traffic in the narrative of faith. Because they offer to people who hear much too often in our society that they are not worthy, that they are not of any value, that they do not matter, a competing narrative, one of hope and love and joy and peace and value, a narrative that is committed to all being welcome and all being granted redemption and release. I'm sure you heard this week they welcomed that young man into their Bible study. The 8 o'clock service, I heard, that makes a church a soft target. If we open our doors, it makes us a soft target. The fact is, our doors are open. And the doors of Emmanuel AME are open, not based on skin color, nor your hair type, nor your bank account. No. Based on the love God has for all of us. African-American churches sound this narrative, this narrative of faith, 
And those who sound and feed on and draw energy from the narrative of fear, they want to silence any narrative that competes with theirs for attention. What narrative are we sounding? What narrative works for us? Friends, it is one thing to be a member of a body that professes belief in Christ and its organizing documents, and it is another thing entirely to embody and practice and live a theology of peace, of liberation, of freedom and justice, of resurrection in the name and spirit of Christ. It is another thing. It is a narrative that competes with fear and hatred and violence and bloodshed to believe that all are children of God. My friends, when we see faith in Jesus as a private matter, we can unwittingly and unintentionally collaborate with the narrative of fear. If we see faith as private and we hear racist comments or encounter bigotry among our friends or our families or our coworkers, private faith that we keep to ourselves will not empower us to challenge these voices of the narrative of fear. And in so doing, we may offer to people the sense, the wrong-headed sense, that to follow Jesus includes permission to see some people as lesser, as jokes, to view some of those whom God has made as subordinate. And among followers of Jesus, to demonstrate to those around us that there are tears, levels in the body of Christ such that it is okay, valid, part of our faith practice to deny full personhood to some people whom Jesus has made our brothers and sisters. The idea, the thought, the conceived plan to massacre black people engaged in Bible study because they have to be stopped because they are taking over our country as the shooter shared before he shot. The idea to attack African American churches, the idea to threaten to bomb a prayer vigil being held at a black church, these do not spring from nowhere. They are formed. They are part of a misguided theology or ideology of fear. Young people who come to have these ideas, they learn them from adults. Young people are not born with these kinds of ideas. They learn them from adults, adults who are captivated by fear. They are part of a lived theology, a lived ideology that many Christians embody and practice thoughtlessly because they do not understand. We do not understand how vicious, how deadly, the competition for narratives can be. When radical groups target young people as they targeted the young person who took the lives of others this week, the church must be crystal clear. We in the church must be sure that people understand what we are about. We who follow Jesus must challenge narratives that are not the gospel. We are called to share the narrative the gospel narrative that it offers life instead of death, hope instead of despair, love instead of hate, faith instead of fear. This gives urgency, friends, to our ministry with young people, with youth, with young adults, with children, that they may hear and be formed with the narrative by which we live, that they may grow up not confused about what we believe and what is important. In response to the disciples crying out, Jesus speaks to the wind, Jesus rebukes the storm, peace, be still, our English text says, which is in the imperative. The grammarians in the crowd will be happy to remind you. But the Greek is even stronger. The literal meaning of the Greek is be silent, be muzzled. In the same way that Jesus rebuked unclean spirits, he rebukes the death-dealing forces of chaos, disorder, and evil in the storm. He rebukes the narrative that teaches 
powerlessness and despair that ends with us saying, what can we do? We can do nothing about this ongoing carnage. He rebukes the narrative that leads to death. He rebukes the narrative of fear. Jesus has power over these forces. That's the good news today. Jesus has power over these forces. And Jesus gives that power to us. We have power over the death-dealing forces of chaos, disorder, and evil in our midst. We are called by Jesus to have faith. Faith strong enough to stand up in the face of chaos, disorder, and evil. To stand up to these forces, to be those heard sounding the narrative of faith. We are called to the same faith that enlivens and upholds members and leaders of Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, who are holding services today on their regular schedule, and of Bishop Norvell Goff, appointed to lead the congregation until a new pastor is found to replace Pastor Clementa C. Pinckney, the pastor of this historic congregation who was killed with his parishioners. Bishop Norval Goff, who stated yesterday that services will be held as usual to make the point that faith is stronger than fear, hope is stronger than death. We are called to the same faith as my many African-American pastor colleagues across the nation, some of whom pastor colleagues who have received threats this very week who will climb into their pulpits today believing in Jesus and his power to save. I mean, that's an amazing, awe-inspiring thing that they will do that under threat. We are called to have faith and to speak the narrative of faith, faith as strong as those who are in peril, faith that redeems, that saves, that transforms. And to the extent that understanding all of this and working toward empathy with our African-American brothers and sisters in Christ is for us a journey over to the other side, a journey to a land we do not know or understand. Jesus calls us to that as well. Friends, let us go over to the other side. Let us see Christ in the faces of brothers and sisters whose life experience is so very different from our own. And let us stand with them, supporting one another, that our faith may be stronger than our fear. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.